Morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Welcome, welcome. We're going to give people a few minutes to, to trickle on in. Um, and as we do that, um, I'm going to put uh, my question in the chat. Um, if you can share your name, pronouns, title, and organization, and answer the question. And the question is, when thinking about fundraising, what are the first challenges that come to mind? You could just put your um, information in, um, in the chat or feel free to come off mute and, you know, show your face and show your voice with us. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. As you guys coming in, um, can you please answer the um, question on the screen? Um, I'm also put it in the chat. Um, just show your name, pronouns, title, organization, and when thinking of fundraising, um, what are the first challenges come to mind? We're going to give it a couple more minutes for people to settle in. We got a few people in the chat. So we got good morning, Edwin, youth program director. Um, how can well oh, this moving kind of fast? <laughs> uh what was the question? How can we get people to buy into your fundraising and support? Okay, great question. Now uh, we have our executive director of the room. Morning, Angela. We definitely call you if you need support. Thank you for the support. Appreciate you. Hey, Jennifer Jones. First thing that come to mind is this fundraising project, attainability, and how can we stand out from the rest? And some of these questions, I went over the uh, slide with um, our wonderful Estelle. I feel like we can um, give some, some answer to these.
Hi, everyone. These are some excellent questions. Um, thank you so much. And thank you again for joining today. This is wonderful. So, yeah. I'm about ready to start. How about you and Sarah? You ready? Yeah. Yeah, I'm definitely ready to start. All right. Um, once again, uh, thank you uh, for the questions. Um, hopefully we get to um, all these questions as we go through our, our presentation. Hello, everyone. My name is Bobo. I'm the um, program manager here at AMPT. Um, and just thank you for being in the space. Um, next slide, please. Um, as this is a, you know, virtual um, webinar, you know, make sure you, you get comfortable, get you water, tea, coffee, whatever your drink of choice is. Um, we're going to be here. Um, we're going to try to give you information, but also try to um, engage you um, in a way we we'll, um, any way possible. As we go through our presentation, if you have any questions, uh, we will have time for questions, but also make sure you put your questions in the chat. Um, that way we can just go through it and make sure we um, get um, every question answered. Next slide, please. Okay, so our uh, mission and vision um, at AMPT. So our vision is um, to sustain um, Chicago um, Latin Black um, Black and Latin um, small community organizations and communities. Um, and the way we do that when our mission is by increasing the organizational health of these small nonprofits. Um, and we all know that Chicago on the um, south and west side, these um, organizations are um, intentionally um, de-invested in. And so we prioritize organizations on, um, on the south and west side that are primary um, Black and Latin led. Um, next slide. How do we do that? Uh, we do that through um, build, amplify, and prioritization, right? So how do we build? We build um, the small nonprofits on the um, south side and the west side, but these nonprofits have to be on um, a budget of a $2 million. And even um, intentionally in our last um, cohort, our executive coaching cohort, we even chose nonprofits that have like a budget of like $100,000. So we want to target these small buddy nonprofits and make sure we help build them. And also we transition to amplifying their work. So we're not going in there and being big brother and telling them do this, do that, do that. We're amplifying the things that they're already doing, right? The passion that they already put into that. And we probably prioritize our um, relationship, developmental relationships, right? Because when you're doing any type of community work, we all know it's like relational work. It's always about how you're relating to the people, how you're relating to the funders, how you're relating to the community and make sure that we're serving them. And as we transition to the next slide, I'm going to hand it off to our wonderful Estelle's. Um, she's super dope. She's our own amped um, stylist. Um, she got great sense of taste. You'll see if you come to our events, but Estelle, you can take it over. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here this morning. Um, I'm Estelle Lozano. My pronouns are she and her, um, and I'm the current director of development for AMPT Chicago. Uh, in my current role, I oversee our grant management, donor relations, alternative revenue streams, fundraising, and sponsorships for the organization. Uh, in my previous work, I helped found uh, Dish Roulette Kitchen, which is a nonprofit headquartered in Pilsen, supporting Chicago's independent startup restaurateurs uh, to build sustainable businesses and attain equality and equity within the food sector. Uh, prior to this, I was a director of development for Healthy Hood Chicago, where I helped the organization build its first uh its first revenue uh, models, as well as attain its first governmental contracts and really help develop like what their foundational structure should be. Uh, prior to that, I have about a decades long uh, career in, as a consultant and marketing professional where I specialize in brand development, specifically for food, big food and beverage companies. Um, and so I really do use a lot of that background in a lot of my um projects and thinking um, and experience to, to push forward in nonprofit. Uh, so thank you again for being here with me today. So today's agenda. Uh, in this webinar, we will discuss bootstrap strategies to generate your alternative revenue streams that are centered around your existing assets and connections. Uh, this webinar is really thinking about things from a, a, bootstrap, a bootstrap perspective and uh, how can you start generating revenue from things that you already own and operate.
So we're gonna move into our first topic, which is tapping into your owned resources. But first, what are owned resources? So owned resources are assets, services, and platforms that your organization has built, owns, and or leases. These are things that already exist in your own four walls. Some examples of this. Uh, so we have assets, which you know we can think about as your office space, if you rent any, uh, your equipment, but then we could think about other things that you've created on your own, like your contact list, uh, proprietary programming, workshops, and course materials. So everything that you already provide out for your recipients, that can be uh, considered an asset as well. Um, proprietary research and any insights that you have cultivated from that research over time. Uh, and of course, your staff and volunteers. For platforms, you have to think about your social media handles, um, but also your website any kind of digital communication that you push out like a weekly or monthly newsletter. Um, and then any councils, collectives, affinity groups, any kind of uh, network groups that you've created over time, those can also be considered uh, part of your own resources. And lastly, your services. What the work that you already do and how that is facilitated and managed can be considered a service that ultimately uh, could be something that you rent or utilize out. So like your program development, uh, program facilitation, speaking services, really thinking about anything and everything that you do um, and how it could be utilized outside of your four walls. So now that we have this idea of what are our own, re our own resources, how do we utilize those resources and turn those into revenue? First thing to keep in mind is leverage what you own by offering it for a fee. If you are paying for something or have purchased something, chances are that others are in need of the same things. Think about what your needs would be without your current resources and create business models around those that utilize your own assets as a service for pay. Secondly, repurpose what you have built to fuel your alternative revenue streams. Proprietary materials like curriculum, workshop development, and program facilitation and management can become paid services that your organization can offer to other businesses and entities. Really think about this. Anything that you have created uh, could become fuel for your alternative revenue streams. So now thinking about all the pieces that you have and how you could potentially package them out, how do you turn these resources into, into income? So here are some examples. Let's think about space, right? If you have space and equipment and you have staff management, you put those together and what could that become? potentially a rental program. You could take your existing newsletter plus a contact list that you have already cultivated in your own four walls and your staff management, and that could become an advertising and sponsorship program that you can offer out. And again, these are all things that if you utilize what's in your four walls already, it shouldn't cost any additional outside of time and labor. Let's take your program development skills. Maybe you're not very, uh, you're not up and running in a digital perspective, but you do have programming and you do have people to run those programs, right? Or you, you yourself have practices of facilitation, right? So you take your development plus your facilitation practices and you could create a customized program services. Let's take your contact list plus data collection management, again, things you already do. And you can create a custom survey and focus group services, right? So these are just, again, these are just ideas, but it's really thinking about what you already do and how you can 
really utilize those to help become sustainable practices in the long run um, without having to take on additional costs um, and really thinking about how can you repurpose things that you've already spent money and time on in order to essentially pay pay your, your organization back for the money that you've already invested in these and then continue to build uh, upon that revenue stream that you've built out. So it's your turn. Let's ideate together. I'd like everyone to take eight to 10 minutes to list out your own resources. Really think about everything that you have um, and, and just try to list out like what would maybe be the most valuable outside of your four walls. I'm going to put a timer on, guys. Please uh, feel free to uh, take this time to, to really think about everything that you have. I have a question. Sure. Um, oh, let me come up with my camera. Uh, so my question is, so are we saying that we're taking everything that we have in our four walls and we're turning them into income? So meaning we're turning them into some sort of program to sell? Am I getting this right? Yeah, so the idea is that not necessarily to sell, but like how can you repurpose things that you've already built or owned to create a either paid service um, that can generate revenue outside of what you're already doing. So it's really thinking about what kind of assets that you currently have that can be repurposed to generate more, more income. Um, outside of just your traditional grants and uh, and donors and things like that. Got you. Okay. We have another question asking, what is the bootstrap method? So bootstrap just means like very, very, uh, bootstrap just means that like you are taking the very bare minimum of what you have. So you're not investing, you're, these are just utilizing the lowest hanging fruit um, opportunities based on what you already own. Uh, being very, uh, being very budget conscious and being very resourceful with existing materials. So in essence, like if we own our own property, that could be something that I could rent out to somebody else. That would be one other source. Yes. Or even okay. if you lease, even if you lease. lease. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Gotcha. Do you mind flipping back to that other page? I think that's 11 right before this one where you had the examples. Yeah. Yes, okay. Um, and I could actually flip back one more to just, if you would like to see the... There we go. And then here's a, here's a page of additional assets um, and some other ideas. I also just shared that previous slide, the first slide we flipped back to in the chat for um, people to utilize as well.
Okay, everyone. Um, is everyone in a good spot? Um, does anyone need a little bit more time? If so, please let me know in the chat. Okay. So now that you have your list, let's review your resources and list out ideas for a new revenue stream based on what you own. So very much like the slide before this, in thinking about those different examples, how can you arrange what you currently have into a potential new revenue stream? And I don't think there's any silly ideas here whatsoever. I think it's really great to think outside the box and really be resourceful with what you have. So the sky is the limit, but um, let's take a few more minutes to kind of think those through and what those possibilities could be. So I have a question about the page that's up. Is that okay? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. I'm kind of new to a lot of this. Um, so when you say my newsletter plus the contact list plus staff management, that can be as an advertising and sponsorship program in essence to look at it like that? Yeah, I mean, I could kind of elaborate on that. So in traditional newsletters that go out that any kind of news or periodical uh, will send out, they typically do actually sell um, advertisement space in oh, some okay, of their gotcha. newsletters. And okay. because you have this very nice, very curated, very unique contact list that makes right it very attractive, right? And so those are just opportunities that you could potentially offer out. But it's kind of thinking about like, again, like what do we already have and how can we maximize it uh, for potential revenue growth alongside what the actual purpose of it, of it is. So it's not really changing what right. you're doing, right? right but also absolutely. like, how can, we, how can we piggyback on things that right. we've already built in our practicing? So then the contact list plus data collection management is a custom survey and focus group services. So I would ask you who have maybe a trucking company. I mean, how would I custom survey and focus group services? Can yeah, you see that? Uh, so I could explain that that potential example and idea out. Um, so a lot of times different businesses, different companies, different other organizations, even foundations are really interested in, in doing group surveys or focus groups. Because you have a strong network and contact list, you have a really good opportunity to be able to, and again, this is all would be volunteer, of course, but it would, you you have this opportunity to offer out surveys um, and focus group opportunities to your network that your organization can in turn charge for those services to an, orga to an organization or a business entity that would be interested in servicing, surveying uh, your, your contact list or your network. Does that make sense? Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm.
All right. Just about, we have, I have two more minutes on the timer. Um, so we have about two more minutes. Let me know if, uh, if you have any additional questions, I'm happy to, to answer. Yeah, I have um, a quick question actually um, sure. related to the advertising and sponsorship program. Um, that's something that our organization has been thinking about, like how we could, you know, sell ad space in our newsletter. And, you know, if we're promoting stuff on our social media, how we could potentially make money from that. But a struggle for us has just been thinking through how we would price it in a way that would actually be, you know, lucrative, not only for us, but like at a price where folks would be willing to pay for it. Here's if you just had any tips on when it comes to pricing, things like that, like maybe steps we can take to figure that out or just resources we could reference. Um, yeah. Cause I know that's been a challenge. Yeah, absolutely. Well, first I think the easiest way to just get a, a good sense of pricing um, is actually to just look at other, um, other media offerings that exist out there. So, um, I think a really good comparable would be uh, some of these like Instagram media groups, for example, uh, because they have very well tiered pricing that's a little bit closer to uh, an individual or smaller organization rather than like a big, you know, newspaper or something like that. Right. So I think that's a really good first step of just doing some cold research of just knowing like what pricing is out there. But then additionally, I think thinking about it from a tiered perspective, so uh, creating tiers for big sponsorship, right? That's that that's a, would be a different price than something like a local business, um, and then potentially like even less of a price for for a uh, like another organization or something like that. And so I, I would really think about tiered pricing based on who your potential um, partners are in in this, um, I think that's a really strong way of being able to keep your doors open to any size business, but without uh, without uh, alienating anybody and not missing like you know a potential larger uh, investment from like a, a bigger company. Um, so that's what I, I would probably do as the first baby steps within that. Okay, uh, we are at time. So uh, before we move on, would anyone like to share some of their ideas? Uh, you can go ahead and speak up first, um, or you can drop your name in the in the chat, whatever uh, works best for you. Um, I can go. Um, I will say that a lot of uh, your points that you wrote down kind of resonated with me, actually, with some of the services that we already provide, but it kind of made sense the way that you had brought it down in tiers of how we can turn those around of like renting out space or like uh, partnering with local organizations who are looking to come in and, you know, uh, engage with your demographic for people, you can charge them for coming into your space and stuff like that. So that generates revenue. So I definitely got that trainings um, as well as uh, facilitations of like, we do that already with our gender affirming care uh, with uh, some of our court corporate partners, but we haven't put a price on it. So I think that's the part there that I'm stuck at it. It's like, how do you price out a fee of services for something you're doing as an organization? Yeah. So I think first <laughs> off, the easy, the first thing you should do for anything is literally list out what it costs you to do it, right? Like mm -hmm. what is the cost? And I mean, I include everything from the electricity bill per day to, you know, how many hours of a certain employee or employees that will be in there and what is that cost per hour, cost per day, like really work that out. So you know what your net cost is and that you would probably want to at least charge double that amount in order to cover the costs of your labor and internal resources and then be able to make uh, a profit on top of that, right? And so I think if you don't have any great like 
um, references as to like what this is priced out into the market, you do have an understanding of like what you need to make and charge in order to one, cover your own costs and to be able to make some additional profit. And then you can grow based on that. Uh, remember, a lot of these are going to be initially experiments, right? Like these are new services that you're offering. You are also going to have to start feeling out like what a potential customer base is. And so you are going to have to experiment a little bit with pricing, but I think to make it worthwhile at the very least is one, figure out what your, what your base cost is. And then essentially I would, I like to say just double that. Um, if that seems like a really ridiculous number, you could scale that down a little bit, but at the bare minimum, you need to cover what it's going to cost your organization to run this. Does, does that help in yeah. trying to just do that first initial steps? Okay. Thank you. Uh, does anyone else want to share? I just said, actually, I, I wanted to share, but it, it was more of a question. Sure. Um, I, I I have more of a concept that um, <laughs> that I'm I'm, I'm trying to I, I've been testing the waters with when I go to different uh, organizational meetings and and tapping into my resources. Everyone likes the idea, but I haven't figured out how to monetize it yet. Um, and it it kind of draws on some of the experience that we have, and and the concept. It's not anything new, but it's it's talking about an ecosystem because um, I just see one of the the critical needs is a lot of the organizations that have duplication of services. There's not clear communication, and it's um, but there's a lot of need and the communities that have fallen through the gaps because services aren't you know put together and and I think that we can be an excellent convener to put the right organizations with the right people and 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 facilitate that and, but that's as far as I've gotten with yeah you know I think I think really thinking about those kind of management facilitation and, and program development um skills can definitely be repackaged into into services and they go beyond just other nonprofits right like yeah, these are yeah. services that that you know everything from schools to big companies um are all interested in it's just about like making it seem that like this can be applicable to them um i think it's a really great way to think about it, especially if you have like a large staff base or a large volunteer base that you can easily mobilize like that is something that a lot of organizations don't even have the capacity to do or more so like other uh big organizations who tend to do a lot of uh planning and structuring and are tend to get are tend to get grants and, and larger endowments to do big projects, but they typically don't always have the boots on the ground to do things like that, right. I think is a really good, you know, middleman kind of service that you don't see uh, really advertised in any way. And so like creating an offering, a unique offering around, around that. And I think would be, would, would really do you well. Um, okay. Of course, it, you'd have to explore like what pricing and and how right, right. usable that is but i i you know just in my in my experience it seems that being able to mobilize groups of volunteers or mobilize um staff in order to make something go from 0 to 10 very quickly um mm -hmm. seems to be there seems to be a need for that um, okay yeah thank you yeah you can go next um i have a couple of things that i think that I guess I really didn't look at it first as far as fundraising. I didn't see these as fundraising, but we have uh, several places that I can rent out some space, do some rental space, whether it be so somebody needs some places for some meetings or small events, different things like that, even for community events, engaging the um, people and neighbors if they want to get out some information, have some um, informal uh, meetings for residents where they can I can charge them a fee then also speaking engagements um probably need to do more of that I didn't even look at that as fundraising <laughs> so more speaking engagements definitely 
and also doing our own events. We always had success with mid-level events, like maybe 75 people or less. We always were successful. We did charge a fee. It is work that goes into those, but we always did come out with a profit. Uh, rental of equipment, rental of vans. We can rent out vans. We have transportation vehicles that we could possibly rent out, rent out, out of equipment that we have. Um, then I thought about the selling the space on the newsletter. We do about a thousand newsletters once a month. And I can probably offer, you know, some of the people who I know I already do business with, offer them for a small fee to advertise on our newsletters to that uh, community of people who they probably don't even know. And they may want to uh, get some of those services like the auto repair man or different things like that. So that was definitely a good idea. And then I had collaborating with other organizations because I do have the staff, we do have programmings and we do have participants, we have youth. So like if somebody wanted to do say drones and they had a grant, but they didn't have participants, well, they can come to my space and teach my children, but maybe instead of me paying them, they can pay me because maybe they've already got the grant and they don't have the space or the participants. So this was um, pretty good information. That stuff I hadn't thought. I'm thinking fundraising. Oh, you got to go to donors. Oh, you got to have this. And not even realize that this is, you know, whatever amount it could bring in, every little bit helps to uh, put some money to the side to uh, help. Go ahead. So, well, I think that was all excellent. I, I, it is making me so happy to hear uh, that this is opening up new ideas for you. Um, I think this is how everyone needs to think about their organization because so much of what we invest in uh, can actually work for us in the back in the background while we are doing our our mission, right? Like while we are doing our regular programming and whatnot, I think these are great ways and great opportunities to to think about how else you can utilize things that, again, you already own to help get you to a, a better a space uh, from a revenue perspective. And these are things that, again, you can work on and build up and scale up or scale down um, based on your needs and your activities, not the same as like thinking about uh, you know, worrying about fidelity donors or, um, you know, being on the grand cycle, this gives you a little bit more control um, of how you bring in income. And then that income doesn't have any strings attached, right? And so um, I think that the way that you are all thinking right now is exactly the way that you should be in, in figuring out ways to best utilize everything that, that you have in order to find uh, a little bit more profitability along your way um, that may turn into a very consistent form of revenue um, that lives outside of the traditional fundraising uh, mechanisms that are typically utilized by nonprofits. So thank you so much for, for practicing this with, with me. And um, I really hope that you've generated some great ideas that you could implement um, on your side. Uh, so with that, uh, we're going to move on, on to our next topic, which is optimizing your relationships. Uh, and, and when I say relationships, I really do mean all of your relationships and thinking about your network. So with that, who makes up your network? Uh, your network is larger than you think. Consider everyone you know and how they can amplify your message. Ask yourself, who could be your organization's biggest cheerleader? Consider tapping into, well, first and foremost, your board. <laughs> they should definitely be your biggest cheerleaders through and through. Uh, your community partners, local businesses and vendors. I really do think that this is a really strong one and we'll get into why I, why I think uh, smaller businesses versus very large organizations and corporations are really, really great unique partners. Um, your staff, your alumni communities. So any school you've gone to, whether that is a grade school, a college, a trade school, whatever those alumni communities are, those are communities that you can tap into. 
uh, schools that you've attended. So not just your alumni community, but the schools themselves tend to have resources and opportunities that maybe you haven't even considered um, or they haven't even considered um, in ways that you can partner. Uh, we also have program participants, your volunteers, uh, current and previous grant providers, former employers, local government, your friends and their friends, <laughs> and of course your family. Uh, the, your network is not limited to what we have out here, but it's really just thinking about your network is bigger than just your professional connections, right? And this is kind of a way to, to start thinking about how you can connect with people and ways that you can work with them that are outside of just monetary uh, investments or monetary donations. So how do we optimize your relationships? In nonprofit work, it's important to lean on your network for support, but with limited capacity, what relationships do you capitalize on first? So I think the most important relationships to, to capitalize on really and to grow are with your board members. Board members should be expected to pledge or fundraise for your organization, period. Like with a fundraising committee, which we'll talk about a little bit later, uh, board members should sign a pledge commitment. If direct financial contributions aren't possible from your board members, like but founders, community members, uh, people like that, uh, alternative pledges can be accepted, like obtaining a sponsorship or providing in-kind pledges and donations for tangible donations, or even pro bono services to your organization. There are things that, <clears throat> that exist outside of just monetary donations, and it's a really good way to one, ensure that your board is committed, and two, it helps you grow your relationships with with these uh, with your board and, and their connected organizations. Two are local businesses and vendors. Uh, these type of relationships can provide sponsorships and in kind tangible donations that can be utilized for things like raffles, thank you gifts, silent auctions, and free service. Uh, what is also really important to know about local businesses is that smaller businesses and independent businesses overall are, they have just a lot less red tape to go through in getting approvals for things like uh, sponsorships or large donations of any kind. It's far e more easy to create those kind of partnerships with a smaller business than it is for a big, large corporation like a Pepsi or something like that. The bigger the organization gets, the more red tape there is as far as legal and how they are able to work with an organization. Additionally, partnering with local businesses also gives them a platform to promote themselves and it in turn helps your community uh, boost its local businesses and keep revenue dollars within your communities. So to me, I, I just always think that, you know, working with local businesses is a very win-win situation for both you and them and ultimately your community. And then three, current and former grant partners. Um, most foundations and funders have special uh, project budgets um, and discretionary funds that can be used for sponsorships of one-off events like galas and fundraisers. It never hurts to ask. And I think that's the biggest uh, point that I love to get across in, in, in talking about just ways of thinking through fundraising. And I just think it's so important to ask. If you are not asking, nobody is going to give. And I think that's a really important thing to just keep in mind is that the more times that you tap someone, the more times that that you engage with somebody, the more likely they are going to actually return and and give or donate their time or you know just do the action that you're expecting out of them through your communications. But if you are not asking, they are not giving. <laughs> So with that, now that we have like this idea of who potentially is in our network and what to cap what uh, relationships to capitalize on primarily, how do we activate your network? So oh. you have a lot of current and potential support for your organization, even if you are not actively engaged, engaging with your network. 
The keys to activating your network are tailored communications and multi-level support opportunities. So some tactics to consider <clears throat> in order to, to meet, meet your, uh, meet your supporters where they are is one, define your appeal groups. And we will, in the next slide, I will explain exactly what appeal groups are. Uh, two, establish a fundraising committee. Three, create a digital fundraising strategy. Four, promote your campaign through your digital platforms and your network's platforms. And five, show your appreciation to your supporters. So tactic one and find your appeal groups. Appeal groups are batches of current and potential supporters categorized by the type of support that you desire to generate from each individual. So we have some examples of appeal groups below. Um, these are just three groups that I've broken out. I have community and volunteers. I have, as my second group is organization uh, social media followers. And my third group is fundraising committee members. So with my community and volunteers, these are people that I definitely want to engage on a regular basis. And I wanna keep them updated on potential engagement and donation opportunities. So I would suggest to send out weekly or biweekly or updates to this specific group um, and also let them know about engagement opportunities on a regular basis. The idea here is to constantly update and keep people engaged so that they come back and volunteer or come to up upcoming events or participate in um, digital fundraisers or any kind of uh, fundraising that you're doing at the time. These this group is particularly very uh, supportive and very uh, very open to volunteering and, and, and showing their support. And so with that, it's important to constantly keep them updated and constantly keeping that kind of flow of communication together. Our next group are organization social media followers. Now, I'm sure most of you know this, that you could have a lot of followers and followers don't necessarily translate into donations. Or, or support or volunteerism, but they are interested, right? And so it's important to talk to them in a way that uh, makes sense for them, but then brings them back to actually get engaged. So for this group, I would suggest doing four to six posts touting success and promoting ways to engage your org. Again, this is, this is a group of people that you typically don't have direct email contact with, but you wanna keep them engaged and supportive and you want to ultimately turn them into potential volunteers or potential donors. And so the best way to do that is to constantly tout your success to them, keep those uh, chains of uh, communication open and create ways for them to engage both digitally and in person. And the last group here, I have a fundraising committee member. So this would be a group of people that you already have very close con contact with. Uh, they potentially already signed a pledge to fundraise with you, but they don't work for you, right? And so they need to be informed and kept up to date. Uh, but again, these are not people that are always in your four walls or that you have direct contact with. So an easy way of staying in contact with them would be, for weekly or biweekly fundraising updates along with individual and group goals. Um, and again, this is a way to kind of keep that pressure on so that they're doing the work that they committed to while you're doing your day to day. Um, and again, these are just examples of potential appeal groups and kind of the messaging uh, that you would want to, to have with them and the amount of messaging um, and communications that you'd want to have with them. So if for the work that you're doing, it's like really looking at like all everyone in your in your network and breaking them out into these kind of uh, categorized groups uh, so that you can make specific communication plans for each group to ultimately get the kind of action that you want out of them. And for every group, it's a little bit different, and which is why it's so important to tailor your communications and create multiple opportunities to get that information over to them. Um, and before we move on, does anyone have any questions? 
We have a question in the chat from the previous slide that was asking, um, what can we do to, what can we do when a board member is not contributing? That is a great question. Um, and I think I do touch on this a little bit later, but we could talk about it now. I think what's really important when a board member isn't contributing, I think it's always important one to go back to, to the pledge and the commitment and, and the contract that was signed. Um, this is why contracts are the most important because when things aren't being met, uh, you can easily just go back to the contract, have a meeting with your board member and say, you know, in a course of a year, what was what was decided and, and agreed upon was that X, Y, and Z were going to happen. We are six months in, we're doing a check, how far we have come. This is, you know, and if they're not meeting those marks, you make a plan of how do we meet this before like, you know, the end of the year. And if those commitments aren't met, those that gives you a very clear and decisive uh, picture of what is going on and if there's opportunity to remove that board member. Um, but also those kind of check-ins allow you to act as an intermediary uh, to, to correct behavior before it has to come down to removing a, a board member or not renewing a board member for a second term. Okay. I just have uh, one question sure. about the 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 appeals group. Is uh, even though we tailored a message, is there a target amount that we're looking for, or is that included in in the messaging that we kind of do? We have certain expectations from each group. Yeah, I think. Again, because they are all they're very unique and specific to to your organization, I think you have to set, set goals based on the actions that you want out of them. So, for example, okay. like the the appeal the first appeal group I have here is community and volunteers. If there is a very specific number of volunteers that you need, then like that becomes your goal, right? And and you yeah. you create the actions to go along with that. Okay, thank you. Um, and one thing too, uh, I think just for everybody to to keep in mind, um, both with the first section and this section, I think it's really important to to be very realistic with yourselves about what projects that you decide to go forward with, knowing your own bandwidth and the capacity of your organization. A lot of the things that I'm recommending today are very much things that you can do internally without having to add on any kind of additional investment. However, the majority of these things do take time to build out and they will need a lot of people time uh, to manage and develop. And so when thinking about all of these different um, different tactics, be, keep please keep in mind like what is your day-to-day -day needs and how much time realistically do you have to to put aside for these additional projects and I would prioritize them based on what your needs are and also like what your capacity is so tactic two establish a fundraising committee so I've mentioned this a few times now but uh, launch a fundraising committee consisting of your most passionate supporters that will commit to pledging or fundraising a set of amount uh, annually. This group of fundraisers will have the responsibility of raising a large group amount of collectively with a commitment of an individual give slash get of a set amount by the end of the campaign. So a fundraising committee would that you this is something that you will build yourselves inside your organization of really your biggest champions and the way to get people to commit is you make them excited and you have them sign a commitment as a group and that they are going to raise collectively a certain amount of money uh, on an annual basis with the intent and knowledge that each individual is responsible for a certain amount, whether they give it personally or they fundraise it by bringing in anything from like ticket sales for a gala to uh, bringing in sponsorships or just bringing in other people that that have that pledge X amount of dollars. Um, 
that those are ways that that they can generate that those kind of funds without having to give it directly from their pocket. Um, and again, the the commitment and pledge is there to to really one make this a real and serious thing to to be committing to and to to give them a very clear goal with the pressure knowing that this is an expectation by the end of the year. So to launch a committee, what you'll first need to develop is a committee overview deck or guide and a commitment pledge. Um, and your, your deck or guide will really have an overview of like what your organization is, what opportunities uh, are up and coming, what your goals are, um, and then, you know, what are the different um, fundraising goals as well as um, how individuals can give um, and what, what kind of other opportunities come with that. Um, and this tool one really describes to your committee of what they need to essentially utilize as information to uh, to talk to other people and bring on those additional donors, but also it helps explain to them exactly what your mission is and what they are committing to and what they are essentially becoming an ambassador for. Uh, then I would also build a fundraising kit for your uh, committee members that includes uh, short snippets of your overview, as well as your different donation levels, uh, logos, uh, donation targets, and sponsorship opportunities. And these are all really giving tools to your committee so that they don't have to come back and ask you individually uh, for different uh, things, information, whatever. They can actually just really run on their own so that this is kind of like a, not set it and forget it, but essentially these are things that could be happening on the back burner while you're going through your day-to-day. -day. Um, and that makes it just a little bit easier and more independent um, and flexible for your committee to be able to, to work. Uh, next, we have a bi-monthly update structure uh, to keep your group motivated and supported. So again, if you are not on your fundraising committee, no one else will be. And so to keep them motivated, to keep them focused, and to keep them accountable more than anything, it is really important to create a, a bi-monthly or bi-weekly structure where you are constantly having a conversation measuring goals and seeing where everybody is to one, keep that pressure, two, keep your uh, those who have pledged committed, and three, just to keep them motivated and excited to, to keep moving forward um, as your fundraising committee. Uh, before I leave that, does anyone have any questions? I have two up here right now. Um. I like the way you said about as far as with the social media is one thing just to um, post pictures or something, but I think we have to do a better job of making that post engaging as opposed to just showing a picture of some kids doing, I'm just going to say something, suppose to showing a picture of some kids doing some playing with some Play-Doh. And then I was let show that picture, but then also make the, announcement or the appeal well wow you know why don't you come by and join in one day or something like that or come by and read a story or come by and build something you know that I can or some kind of way I just got to get some more ideas as far as making those social media posts more engaging where people will like it or share it or call or something like that and then uh, one of the other things you had talked about to me sometimes asking people to give can be a little scary and but i think uh webinars or zooms like this remind us that people really want to support especially if you're doing something good so long as you're doing something good that's impacting that we cannot be slowful about getting that word out and however way we have to do it, get those people to support, you know, engage them so they can support. And then on one more thing about that board member situation, I guess sometimes uh, 
it depends on where we are with our board. You know how in the beginning you just got people on your board so you can have a board. <laughs> then as you grow and learn, you get more people that can possibly give financially and help raise the money. And then I remember we had a young lady. She was fantastic. She really didn't have a lot of money to give, but she helped kept our books. She helped run the meetings because she was in some other organizations. So she knew how to run board meetings and stuff like that. So all of that was beneficial to us. She didn't really have a lot of money to give. So I guess when you know, as far as that um, board giving, we have to look at what is that person bringing that they may not be able to give one thousand or five thousand dollars a year but they're helping you manage this they'll help you manage that they help you know they give you insights information about grants and things like so it just I guess it just matters yeah that's exactly it on the head and i know for sure that there are many people on this on this call right now that have a lot of community members or other nonprofit organization members on their boards and they just aren't equipped to give by, you know, monetary money, essentially, right? Like they they can't give cash, but they may be able to give other services or they may be able to bring on a different sponsor through their connections. That's where I, you know, in the previous slides, I explained that we should hold our board accountable. They should be giving in some way or another, but it doesn't have to be hard cash, right? It does not have to be dollars. It can be, like you said, pro bono services. Um, I think pro bono services sometimes are worth more depending on what those services are. If you're asking your board to give a minimum of $5,000 a year, but there are board members that just simply can't do that, what can they give you that or, or bring to the organization that would be equivalent to that monetary uh, goal. And I think that's a really way of, of thinking about things. Like if someone is doing your bookkeeping and running meetings annually on, you know, a periodic basis, that that is probably more than five thousand dollars on a on an annual basis, right? And so really thinking about that, like it's not necessarily about charging your board, but more so of like really pushing your board to give and provide to the organization that they signed on to to find out, to be a fiduciary uh, partner on and oversight on, like part of the power is having responsibility. And if we could, if if you can cultivate what that responsibility is outside of like a monetary amount, I think that would both benefit you and it would make your board member. Uh, more passionate and more involved in your organization because again you're holding them accountable and they're expected to provide in some way and so if it's not going to be in dollars they're most likely going to be more engaged to provide those what if it's pro bono services or whatever the equivalent service is to to the dollar amount um yeah thank you thank you again for sharing well, I guess as long as that board members is helping the growth of the organization that's that like you said that's important yes that's imp yes mm -hmm. yep and I uh, and I know someone asked like how you know what happens if a board member is not is not providing or, or um, being active I think these are really great opportunities to create proactive accountability of you know if you are thinking about what a board year for 2025 is going to be there can be some additional nu nuances of like, well, maybe you have to be on our fundraising committee or commit to X, Y, and Z. Like the expectation for next year is that every board member will commit to, you know, whatever whatever you, you set aside. And like, th even though that may be not something that you practice in the year before, as you move into a new year there, and as you're growing as an organization, you're all, you have this opportunity to start layering on and providing that more uh, buttoned up structure to your board that will one, help them to be a little bit more accountable, but two, it gives you a way to measure like what is successful in managing your board and what board members are actually providing support. Alrighty. So tactic three, uh, digital fundraising. So this fundraising technique demands creativity, intentionality, strategy, commitment, and follow-up. Uh, below I have some rays of fundraising efforts 
through the use of email and social media appeals uh, to existing and prospective supporters. So I think digital fundraising is a really, really great tool. It's something that 10 years ago, most organizations did not have at their availability. And now everybody can do this kind of marketing um, and fundraising pretty much from their phone, whether you're an organization of one or 100. Uh, digital fundraising is a great tool to, one, uh, do your fundraising, but two, a really inexpensive way of being able to get your message out um, and be able to hold these uh, across multiple platforms and be able to manage them from a very uh, small team. So I have some, a few tactics up here and uh, some just some fake example goals and kind of how, how do you accomplish that, right? So we have tactic one of digital fundraising. This is going to be an email campaign uh, that will then be promoted on social media. So uh, our goal is 6K raise. And the way that we would accomplish that is through a series of promotional emails. Uh, I would suggest doing things like individual emails that are, that are uh, announcing and promoting uh, a digital fundraising campaign on its own. And then if you have a newsletter, for example, or regular newsletters that go out, I would also utilize those to also promote these kind of uh, digital fundraising campaigns. And then you couple that with social media promotion as well. Um, and the idea here is that you are creating multiple opportunities for people to see and, and interact and engage with your message. Um, and then in turn, giving them multiple opportunities to actually donate. Um, I know that this sounds like pretty, pretty standard and clear cut, but the amount of organizations that I have worked with that just don't capitalize on this um, versus the ones that do, you would be shocked by the amount of money that actually comes through digital fundraising. Um, and, I, and it's something that time-wise doesn't take that much time and that much bandwidth from your team, but can ultimately generate anywhere from a couple of grand to $50,000 um, annually, depending on you know, how well you are cultivating your contact list, how many messages are you putting out, and how creative can you get with a campaign in order to bring people in. Uh, next we have, um, so the next tactic we have here is increased donation amount of existing donations during a campaign period. So maybe you're already running digital campaigns, but you need to increase or you'd like to see an increase in donations. Um, so I have uh, reach out to your target donor group and share tailored messaging uh, to this segment via email. So again, reaching out and being very customized with your messaging, knowing that these are people that you talk to on a regular basis. How do you uh, generate them to, to give more on a regular basis? And really that is just touching them more, just reaching out to them more, creating very compelling stories as to why and really building up the urgency of like why this is important now and why doing things like going from giving once a year to maybe giving once a month is beneficial. Um, and then lastly, I have uh, increased the number of new monthly recurring donors. Um, and so very similarly, but um, we would want to include the uh, goal throughout all the email campaign uh, communication. So really blow out um, what our goal is and to create some kind of uh, urgency in order to, to get to that goal. And again, engage with your fundraising committee. So establishing a fundraising committee, really being on top of them of like what the goal is and really pushing them to, to amplify that message out. Again, these are all just different tactics for different examples of what you may be going through uh, with your current fundraising uh, tactics and campaigns and just ways to, to maximize them, right? And, and the idea is always build upon what you already have um, to scale it up. Okay. So next we have tactic four, which is promote your campaign. 
there are many ways to promote your campaign, including creating tailored messaging for your closest friends, allies, and partners to amplify your campaign. Furthermore, think about whether you want to create a PR communications plan that complements your fundraising campaign. If so, uh, make sure you begin working on these efforts as soon as your strategy details and theme are finalized. Um, so let's just say like there's a tactic of like help spread the word about your organization. Very, very blanketed, very broad. But the first way you would do that is one, you would develop a social media strategy. How many times are you going to be posting? Where are you going to be posting? And what message makes most sense? for those different social media platforms. Remember, not all social media is the same. Different platforms have different audiences, and so your uh, message should be tailored for that. Uh, example of this would be your message on Instagram will be very different than the message that you would put on on something like LinkedIn. Uh, LinkedIn would probably be closer to more of your professional contacts, potentially your foundation and grant givers, uh, potentially other large donors. And so that message would be more tailored towards that versus Instagram may be more of your volunteers and local supporters. And so depend, like you're still going to communicate your campaign, but you need to tailor the message on these different social media platforms to make sense for the people that you're reaching on those platforms. Uh, secondly, you want to develop a partner social media strategy and content. So outside of your social media uh, platforms, who else do you know that has a very strong social media presence or can message out to best to the targeted group that you would like this message to go out to um, and partner with them. There are so many uh, like local base uh, social media handles, like little like news outlets or community handles, things like that. Um, your, your local aldermen and your local state reps, um, also just other influencers that you may know or other organizations uh, that are in your network all of which can be utilized to help amplify your message for no cost, right? And so that is just a means of making the ask and creating content that can be easily shared so that if you do ask someone like, hey, would you mind sharing this on your story that you have everything ready to go? And that will one, potentially bring in new followers, uh, new people to engage with, and two, ultimately bring in more revenue dollars. Um, and then... Uh, next would be to develop a press release and identify journalists, editors, and news outlets to engage with. This sounds very uh, daunting, I know, but what really it is, is you could just go on to either social media platforms or onto your Google search and just start searching different news outlets and journalists. Like every, even if it's like Black Club Chicago or the Chicago Tribune, anything like that, You'll, every single article has the byline of who wrote that, and those people are very easy to find. You can find them on LinkedIn. You can probably find them directly through uh, their news outlet websites of like finding their, their specific email address, and you can send them a press release that you already put together or just send them a message saying like, hey, we... We have this event going on. It's, you know, it's very monumental. Explain like why it's unique. Like why would an editor or a, a journalist be interested in it, think about that and just message out. Again, it never hurts to ask. And the more times you t reach out, the more likely you're going to get that kind of coverage that most people would have to pay for. But if you're just willing to do the legwork, you could ultimately get for free. Uh, and lastly, reach out and share your content to the local officials, chamber of commerce and other community orgs to amplify your reach. Okay, and then lastly, we have our last tactic. Um, show your appreciation. There are many ways that you can show your appreciation to your team, donors, and volunteers. Think about how you want to show your appreciation, create a budget for it, and assess if there are any in-kind donations that can assist with executing this campaign area. And then, oops. So below, I just have some examples of what you could potentially create or give to your uh, volunteers, your donors, your um, fundraising committee. 
And I know this sounds like really cheesy, but these things really do matter to people. And it, like org branded gear that is like exclusive to the group of people that you're giving to can work really well. Gift certificates from local businesses, preferably donated, as we said before, cultivate your local businesses into partnerships. Um, thank you brunches, preferably again, donated. Again, these are all ways that you could also collaborate with local businesses or in local partners um, to help help alleviate the cost of these kind of um, tactics. And lastly, complimentary org event tickets or free admission. So if your organization is running uh, a gala or you guys have paid events, having complimentary tickets to that for people who are doing additional work for you um, are really easy ways for you to not have to spend a lot to show your support to your team. Um, and this is just kind of the last little bit. It's a nicety, but um, it's important. You know, the more support you show, the more appreciation you show to the people that are willing to volu volunteer their time and their dollars it goes a long way. And so it's something that um, I think sometimes when we are moving really fast, we kind of forget about, uh, but it is a really important and a very, uh, very lucrative move long-term. Uh, always keeping people engaged and come, having them come back for more and keeping yourself um, in high regards with these people is very important. Um, and that is it. So if anyone has any questions, I believe we have a little bit more time left. Just have one question about the the digital fundraising. How does that compare to um, I guess the 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 fundraising committee? Um, the reason why I'm asking, I mean, we have an established fundraising fundraising committee that's it needs to learn how to do some digital things because uh, it's you know it's it it's outdated. Um, and uh and and they're kind of stuck in their demographics that's dying off and and so they need to expand out a little bit more yeah so digital fundraising typically um you would want to create a campaign around that so i know like for us we have a couple of digital fundraising events throughout the year uh giving tuesday is a really a really good one at, uh, that's like a like the first digital uh, campaign that most organizations kind of uh, marry up to, um, but like create those are like the kind of things that like um, digital fundraising really work for. Like think of it like kind of as an event, even though like you're not going somewhere, but it's more of like the set period of time where you're going to create a fundraising campaign with a name, a fun theme. Maybe you're you know you're you're pushing like if you give X amount of dollars, you'll receive like this nice tote or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. Or maybe it's like your annual annual like raise a thon that you're, you know, this year's goal is to reach $10,000. And uh, maybe that's a way that your org your current committee can take a, a campaign like that and take it to its current uh, potential donor list and say like, hey, you know, this is our goal for this year. Uh, would you be willing to to pledge a match or something like that? Like it just gives them a little bit more of an opportunity to talk about. Um, but then additionally, because the digital campaign essentially lives online, um, you'd probably have like a donation page uh, on your website that it would link to. You would push this on your social media and on your uh your newsletters and things like that. So it's working, it would work in tandem with your okay. committee, but not necessarily uh, fighting with it or having to choose one or the other. Uh, okay. They should both help each other. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So that is all I have. I'm going to turn it back over to to Bobo right now. Um, but if you do need to contact me or you have any follow-up questions, I know that this uh, this presentation was really broad because everybody's own fundraising needs are so unique and specific. So if there's anything specific that you want to talk through or want more information on or you know help in development, please feel free to email me. Um, and I know this all this information will also be shared 
to the group after the um, the presentation, uh, but please feel free to reach out to me uh, if you'd like any kind of follow-up. All right. Thank you, Estelle. Uh, that was a very uh, wonderful presentation. I'm sitting here, I'm learning a lot, even though this is like my third going around um, reading it and actually hearing you present it. Um, right now um, on your screen, we have our next Amped Up Your Org, but this is a little different, right? This is our first in-person Amped Up Your Org. We will be hosting this at our um, at our headquarters, our newly headquarters in um, Cermak, Chinatown. Um, so it's the address is 600 on West Cermak. It's on May 23rd. It would be by Erica. She's the director of community relations at the Chicago Bulls. And it was um, around accessing, um, amplifying your capital. Um, so um, please, I click, I put all the links um, in the chat. Uh, please uh, register. Um, like I said, this is our first in person. So we really want to pack the house. We want to create that environment of networking because it like, goes back to our values. Um, everything is relational. So we want to build those relations. Also, um, as you see what I placed in the chat, we um, have a survey monkey. Um, can you please take um, two minutes to fill that out? It's just so we can um, basically increase um, our efficiency and making sure that you all are serviced, making sure that like, you know, we're doing everything we need to do to make sure that you get the resources um, that you need. Um, and our upcoming events, next slide. Um, so for our upcoming events, we have um, our participatory evaluation cohort. Those applications are currently open. So you can um, apply for that, um, which is basically our evaluation um, cohort. So you will have um, people to kind of teach you how to create an evaluation process. You will have, um, um, custom um, coaching sessions. You will have up to four. Um, and that's also all the sessions are in person. So once again, it's about relations, it's about creating that work um, and also networking with the, your peers that's also within that cohort with you. Um, then we have our office hours. Um, I'll put that link in the chat as well. Um, the office hour is just a time for you to have, you know, more personalized questions with a stale, you know, after you leave here, review some of your notes. So you might have, oh man, I should have asked this, where office hours next Tuesday on the 30th at 12 p.m., you can log into the Zoom and then you can get those questions answered. Um, and all this will be sent up in a follow-up email. Um, I'm just running through them right now. And um, yeah, once again, I access the capital. Um, so just make sure, you know, if y'all are interested in doing that, making sure you take advantage of, you know, having somebody within, um, you know, that um, corporate world in person and like really, you know, utilize them for the experience and their knowledge. Um, so that's about it. Um, thank you all for joining. Um, oh, yeah. Also, the um, the Empt Up Your Org recording is going to be posted on our website and our YouTube page. And also, while you're there, if you check back, we have a lot of these workshops that we did over the past two years. So you might even get more information that you all might need. So make sure um, you go check that out. Um, but thank you all for joining us. Um, I'm going to give you back your time. We finished on a dot. I like that, 1130. You know, we want to start on time. We want to end on time. So um, thank you all. Feel free to reach out to me or Estelle if you have any questions. Um, we appreciate you all. Consider yourself dismissed. Thank you. You're surely welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. One quick question before I drop the next workshop y'all are doing in person. Will there also be a virtual option or just in person? It's just in person. We um we're trying to sophisticate our uh, ourselves to be able to do an effective um um hybrid session. No, makes sense. Well, thank you so much. This was super helpful. All right. Thank you everyone. Have a good day.